every tree and every stone, every rushing wind and moan. They sing your praise, my God. They sing your praise. Every star and open sky, tell of your glory divine. They shout your praise. Please shout your praise, yeah. you stole in my heart, yes you will, you stole in my heart, yes you will, you wiped away the stains and broke away the chains. With your love, you set me free. Three nails gave me liberty. So I sing your praise. My God, I sing your praise. No, with your love, you forgave my sin. I got my past that brought me back again. So I sing your praise. And I sing your praise. You stole in my heart. Yes, you will. You stole in
place amongst us, that our hearts would be free and open, Lord God, to see and to hear what it is that you would say to us tonight. Speak to us through your word, I pray, and be glorified in this place by what is said and done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
tell you that you're a work of art. That's all. No problem. Yes, Cassie. Sorry, wow, it's loud. I wanted to learn Praise the Lord. All right. Tim. All right. So Brent and Tim. Anybody else? Mike. Amen. Amen. Okay, how's your shoulder? You back up to lifting heavy cars and stuff, or all right? Just check. <laughs> there you go. Praise the Lord, glad to hear that. One step at a time, or one one arm movement at a time. What about your dad and your stepdad? Okay. Absolutely. Any better news on his leg or no, not yet? It's, well, that's what they're trying to treat. Right. So I haven't heard any first ever news about any progress. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, Bree. Yikes. Okay. I can't say of a lot of places you could go. Indiana is, well, less threatening than some. Yeah, but, but it's early. All right. Pray God just takes good care of them. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it's Dollar Tree. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Heck, that's awesome. That's good. Praise the Lord. All right, I'll give you uh, I, I'll give you a couple. There, there are some people I can't go into situations, but there are people that just have some real big issues going on in their life. No, it's not me. Uh, you know, there's some people that have that, and we just, you know, just want to pray for them. I mean, it's kind of an unspoken thing, but lots going on around them. 
and uh, and then just uh, I was telling one of our Suriname team members that you know today we got a lot of things worked out. Yay, that was really good. And then I'm on the website for the country and I found some stuff and I went, okay, I, I'm not sure about this, so uh, we're going to get that checked out. We're going to make sure because the last thing we want to do is get off the plane and have them throw something at us that we don't know about. So, you know, this is like new material and I haven't seen it before, so we're going to get it squared away. So I, I don't think it's huge. I don't think it's any kind of a deal breaker, but I do not want to go with those questions unanswered. So let's just pray that all that gets answered and it's not a big deal. It's just national blah, blah, blah stuff that you got to understand. So, okay. Are we ready? Yes. Yeah, please give it. Praise the Lord. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that's a good thing, too. They probably told you, though, what you really need is those fish in Ghana that look at you off the plate, right? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Did you have one? Okay. Well, Pastor Doug. <clears throat> yes. Okay. All right. We'll pray about that. Whew. We built up a lot of things. Okay. Let's see what we can do. Lord Jesus, it's not our power anyway. It's yours. It's not our memory anyway, it's yours. It's not our intelligence anyway, it's yours. Whether those things for us are good or bad, doesn't really matter. Lord Jesus, we come to you and we know that you can take care of it. So I ask you to touch Angela, the Lord, she's had to have this biopsy and, and Lord, I pray that now she's just got to wait. And that's just the medical industry, you just got to wait. So Lord, I pray that you would really truly give her peace, that, that she's going to wait every day and she's going to go through this and there's not going to be any fear. And Lord, whatever they thought they saw or they're worried about saying, there's not going to be anything threatening. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, she's going to be made whole. God, we ask you that you would continue to minister to you, Peck's friend at work, that your boss at work, that uh, had good news. That's a good thing. Continue to minister as she's concerned about custody issues. Help her, Lord, with that. God, I ask that you would reach out and you would touch Lord Roger and Harold. Lord, they, you know, Harold lost his, his sister. That's hard. He's fighting cancer. That's hard. Lord Rogers in with radiation and everything else. That's hard. God, I just ask you that you minister to them, that you would heal them both of cancer, that you lift up their spirits. I ask you that you would minister in a powerful way to Dave Hesburn's dad, the Lord Jesus. He would come out of this health problem on the other side and do well. God, I ask you to touch John, Father, uh, Mike's dad, that uh, he's going in and out of hospice because of care issues. And Lord, at 86, he's tired. And God, I just ask you that you would raise him up. Father, as long as he's going to be in this world, I pray that he's in good health and that he's in good spirits. Lord Jesus, I pray that if there's a time, for all of us there is, that, that we cross over, then Lord, I pray that, that he's ready and his spirit and his life is a great place. Lord, I ask you to keep him here and, and just help him to enjoy his family and the world around him for a while. God, I just thank you for the good things that you're doing for Christine, that, Lord, you're continuing to give her good news from the doctor. I pray that you would continue to give her good news. God, I ask you to touch Brent. Lord Jesus, he's, he's had trouble with his foot for a long time. I ask you to heal it up. I ask you that it would be taken care of. No more wounds, no more problems. That a healing is a tough thing in his situation. But Lord, I believe that you can make it whole. And God, I ask you to touch Tim. Lord, as he's had this brain bleed in the back of his, his brain somewhere, and he's just had all kinds of problems, and they thought maybe he was dead, and he's not. He's opening his eyes or some kind of response. God, I ask you that Tim would be brought all the way through this, healed and made whole. God, I just ask you that you touch Josh as he's getting ready to drive down to Indiana. Keep him safe, keep him whole, keep him awake. 
Lord, let him enjoy the trip. Let him be a good money maker, but not cause any threat or problem. And God, I just ask in your mighty name that you would also minister to some people that, you know, sometimes I know things that other people don't know, and it's not an intelligence question. It's just who tells who. So, Lord, I, in this case, there are just some people that are having some tough times, some big decisions, some things that are in front of them. And, God, I just ask you that you would help them to know when and where and how and well, what those decisions should look like. God, I ask you to give them your comfort and your peace. And, Lord, I just ask you for the what I'm hoping is the very last hurdle. Father, in, in this situation, you have cleared up so many things for Cernop today. I am so thankful for that. Lord, they were just, it was just bumpy for a few days. I am thankful for everybody that wants to go. I believe that you're going to make provision and take care of the financial issues. You're going to take care of the legal folder all. You're going to get us there and, and help us to be a blessing. Lord Jesus, we pray that you'd work this out. And by 24 hours from now, these would be dead issues. Everything would be good. Father God, I thank you. And Lord, as we go to look at your word today, we just trust that you're going to give us your understanding and your discernment to know what you're saying and what it means to us now. In your mighty and holy name. Amen. Praise the Lord. If I forgot anybody, I'm sorry. I tried not to. <laughs> Praise God. We are in the book of Zechariah. We are in chapter 10. I, I wonder if you were doing the creative fade. I'm like, I still hear it. Oh, you're perfect. Great. All right. Good deal. Um, how many of you have had any reason to read ahead in Zechariah? The reason I grin at this, I think I told you this before. I was with a group of pastors, and somebody actually wanted to do this unannounced devotional. And it was the, the second pastor that preached here on Sunday, the Presbyterian pastor. He wanted to read out of Zechariah 1. And I got all excited. And everybody around the table, all these other pastors are like... Now, admittedly, I was the second oldest person at the table, so maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. But everybody else was kind of looking a little blank. And I said, you all read Zechariah, right? So you realize that this has the most you know, messianic prophecy in it of all the minor prophets. This is a big one. This is a, Yeah. You know, so I mean, how, how many of you, what is your least, and so I'm not picking on them. Everybody has a place they land more often than others. What is, let's have three or four of you tell me what your favorite book is. If you're just going to flip the Bible open and you're going to read it, read. Psalms. It's in the middle. It's got cool songs. You're musical. Yay. It, it's good. Anybody else? Romans. Why? Cool. It definitely does. That's a very good book. One of the ones Luther used to uh, to come up with the Reformation. Anybody else? What's that? Corinthians. Why? I love it. This is a hot mess. I am not. Yes. Hey, all right. It's reassuring. <laughs> Okay. There you go. There you go. Mitchell. Okay, why? They're a mess. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, first Kings, Zed Kings are not the most brilliant times in Israeli history. Okay, now we'll flip it on the other way. Where is the book that you probably, you, you say, you know, I'm not sure I've read it very much. Or if I've read it, it's not been very often. I don't really remember a lot from it. You know, what, what book is it that just kind of... Leviticus. How many of you just say it's Leviticus? You, you've been there. Okay. Now, now, why, Michelle? Why is Leviticus a... Okay. All the stuff you got to do. Okay, okay, I understand that. Yeah. Which okay. How many of you know that Ecclesiastes is actually a really cool book because it's a story of a guy that's done everything the wrong way on purpose and finally realized why it's wrong? Yeah. 
No, no, it's, it's, it's in the Old Testament. It's, uh, it's King Solomon. You know, he actually goes to test all the excesses in life and then comes back and goes, these are stupid. Why did I do this? I'm just a really loose pastor to paraphrase. Okay, yeah, read. Revelations. Okay, why, why is Revelation not a place you land in very often? Okay. How many of you have ever read some of that stuff and go, eee, by the time we're done with this, like, most people are dead. And, you know, I mean, okay, it can be scary. Some people love it. They, they, you know, a glimpse of the future, other people. Yeah, it is. That, that's a really good chapter. Anybody else over here has been real quiet? Anybody else over here? Is he, why Ezekiel? What is this? Okay, how many, I mean, the, the latter part of Ezekiel, some of the hardest to translate, you know, for actual Bible scholars, right? They look at it and they're trying to get what the point of view is and where is that going to go. It's incredibly deep prophecy of things that he sees for the future of Israel, which are pretty cool. But it does take some heavy shoveling sometimes to get through it. Okay, my, I, I won't say it necessarily a book, but I will say my least favorite chapter, and I've told you before, is in the book of Numbers. And it's what I call the ditto chapter. Now, how many of you know that all Scripture is inspired of God and is useful for the things that it's useful for? So I'm not saying this shouldn't be in there. I get it. From a theological perspective, it shows that every single tribe of Israel has a leader that comes and brings an equal sacrifice for the good of the Levitical priesthood. And it is literally listed each time what they brought. But it's a long list. And after you've read the first go-through, you have 11 more exact replicas. So I have to admit, I get to that one, I kind of read the first one, and I say, ditto. And that's done, I skip to the end, because there's literally nothing different in the entire rest of this very long chapter. So maybe not my favorite thing, even though I get from a Jewish perspective, every tribe could say, we were in this equally, we all have skin in the game. I get it, it's just hard to read. I also sometimes have a hard time reading all of the sections in Joshua about the distribution of the land. And the reason for that is I don't know where any of those places are. I can look on a map and get somebody's guess, and that's not a bad thing to do. But how many of you know the map meant a lot more to the people at the time than it does to us quite a bit later? We don't know where those places really are. They don't have the same emotional hit on us. So, okay, Zechariah, that was cool. It's got a lot of cool stuff in it. So, we are in chapter 10, and we are going to start in verse 5, because we did actually begin the chapter last week. Together they, this time the they is the Israelites, together they will be like mighty men, trampling the muddy streets in battle. Because the Lord is with them, they will fight and overthrow the horsemen. Now, I've got at least one Gentleman who is an army officer here. Jerry, what is the problem with muddy, muddy streets in a theater of war? I don't know what's on muddy streets. Okay, you don't know what's on them, what's hidden under them. Okay, what else? They're slippery. Okay, anything else? Mitchell. Slows movement. Slows movement. How many, how many of you know that can be really difficult to get the trucks, or back in the day, the horses and the soldiers, where you want them to be at the time you want them to be, if you've got really nasty, difficult, muddy lanes? So if you look at this image, you might just go, oh, okay, they're walking in the mud, yay. How many of you know that it says they trample? That word trample means they are in charge of the environment that they're in. So when God touches his people and puts them into battle someday, the terrain will not stop them. Now, how many of you thought of that when you read that? I don't think a lot of us do, right? I mean, I, it's not something I think that pops to our minds. We're used to mostly paved roads where, you know, I, I mean, I know how many of you live on a dirt road? A few of you do. Okay. But, I mean, a lot of us live on paved, live on paved roads, right? And we're kind of used to that. So we don't think about the, how it slows you down and the mess that it makes. All right. The second uh, sentence in that, because the Lord is with them, and again, the source of the, Israel, the Israelite victory is God. It's not their strength, not their intelligence. They will fight and overthrow the horsemen. Now, we don't have a lot of horsemen in the army today. Not a real big unit. 
But what, what were horsemen used for historically? What's that? Just by, yes, yeah, sometimes there's just scouts that can move quicker than infantry. What else did you say, Michelle? To charge. Okay, charge and attack quickly. They move faster. Yeah, what do we use second then? Because it's pretty much the same thing. Okay. It's the shock force, right? They can move quicker than the marchers. They hit hard. If they're archers, they can actually also skewer you with their arrows. How many, how many of you think you could actually fire a bow from a moving horse and hit anything? The ground. I could hit, yes, I could hit the ground every time. I probably succeed at that. But I mean, think about the skill necessary to ride on a galloping horse and skewer your enemy. I mean, that's just bizarro. You know, I mean, there are people that could do that. Now, until more. There were later in the Middle Ages, there were infantry units that had weapons. And I know you didn't come here to learn this today, but I'm just giving you a context. There were things like pikes and halberds that extended the reach of the infantry and allowed an infantry block to keep out cavalry. So they would block up before they even had guns, and they could break a, a, a charge. But in the ancient world, while they had phalanxes, and sometimes in certain terrain, phalanxes could stop cavalry, usually they couldn't. The horse can be armored, that's called a cataphract. The horse can be armored, it weighs more than you, it's moving faster than you. Now they didn't ride like for hours and hours and hours on armored horses, they'd wear their horses out, they couldn't do it. But for a while in battle, like a mechanized unit, they run in and they smack the infantry, knock them down, wade through them and kill them and ride away before the army can reorganize itself. Again, I'm not an officer in the military, but Jerry, would you say that's at least a somewhat sensible unpacking of... Okay, the value of the horses. Now, in the, as I said, in the Middle Ages, later Middle Ages, did infantry ever beat horses? Well, yeah. Did it happen on extremely rare occasions in the ancient world? Yeah, depending on who's commanding them, where they're at, blah, 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 blah. But how many of you know most of the time infantry doesn't win in that contest? But God says, not only will muddy terrain not stop my troops, horses won't stop my troops. The shock weapons of the time won't stop my people when I am with them. I will strengthen the house of Judah and save the house of Joseph. Now by this time, after the exile, do you recognize that the northern and southern kingdoms have been at war with each other and competing with each other for a very long time? The days of David and Solomon in the United Kingdom went away a long time ago. So you know, Israel is like the north and the south in the civil war here, but instead of the, the north beating the south and reabsorbing them, in those days they stayed split. And they fought with each other for a long time. So God is saying, not only will I take care of my armies and deal with their issues, I will begin to reunify and reconnect the pieces of my people so that they function together. I will restore them because I have compassion on them. Notice he doesn't say he's going to restore them because they got good. I love the fact that you mentioned first and second kings. Are the Jews God's people? Yes. Does God still have intentions and plans for his people? Even today? Yes, he does. You find that in Revelation and other places. He certainly does. How many of you know God did not pick them because they were holier than any other nation on earth? I mean, if you really look, they're, they're, I mean, in my own Pastor Jeff terms, I use the term thick skulls. Because they were. I mean, they had some great times. They had some very limited times in Israeli history where they seemed to get it right. They had the right king. They had the right, you know, priesthood actually doing the right stuff. They weren't worshiping idols and trees and stones and stars and other things. And, you know, there were times that for a while they did pretty well. But inevitably they're going to fall into the, the, the hole again. Inevitably they went back to paganism. They were trying to do what everybody else was doing around them. Okay, we've got a couple of younger people here, so this is not prejudicial to the four of you younger people, five of you younger people. Yes, Bree, six of our, our younger people. Uh, okay, um, how many of you remember? How many of you remember being a teen? 
I barely remember that. Okay, Xavier, you, you remember being a teen. What is one of the most important things to you as, I'm going to say, an average teen? What is one of the most important influences in your life as an average teen? All of you might say, I am so far above average, I have no idea what you're talking about. And good for you. But if you have any idea what the average is like, what you, friends, doing what your friends do. You realize, don't you, that the Jews are kind of like average teens. They're doing what everybody else is doing on the street. Now, maybe you didn't, and I've always met teens who are above that, that line, and they don't go there, and they're sharper and more focused and more godly, and they, that's awesome. But, you know, you don't generally look to your average teen on the street for deep spiritual understandings. Some have them, but that is not generally the average thing. How many of you don't probably get employment instructions and information from the average teen on the street? Yeah, you know, again, they're not stupid, but they don't have a life experience full of lots and lots of jobs yet. So that kind of takes more time, all right? So if you want to look at the Jews, instead of picking on them or feeling like I'm picking on them, they are godly people or God-chosen people who are in a neighborhood full of other average teens who are behaving in ways that they shouldn't, and they're going out and doing it again and again and again and again. So God doesn't restore them because they're better than you, better than their neighbors, he doesn't restore them because they earned it. He restores them because he has compassion. Now, if that's true of him, is that true of you? If the Son of God lives in you, do you think that God sometimes will restore you, not because you earned it, but because he loves you? Now, this is one that might pick on older people because maybe the younger people haven't had time to do this so much yet. How many of us older people have some mess-ups in our life that we're not really proud of? And if I'm asking you, you wouldn't want to tell me. Just you. Yeah, yeah, right. There's stuff. Me too. There's stuff we're not real proud of. It's not our brightest, boldest moment. It's not our deepest spiritual conquest. And yet, how many of you know that God forgave you if you asked him? That he often restored us from the results of those decisions that we made in the past. Okay. Now, this is cool. I will restore them because I have compassion on them. Next sentence. They will be as though I had not rejected them. You think of the 70 years in Babylon. You think of all those years in the 9th and the 8th centuries when their kingdoms are shrieking under conflict. They're fighting each other. They're stealing other people's stuff. Everybody's starting to hate them. Like that never happened, I will restore them. Has it happened? How many of you realize that even in the 60s and the 70s, a lot bigger and wealthier countries attacked Israel and they won every time? Kind of cool. Again, I know, Jeff, you, you studied military history. Isn't it pretty cool? You know, the things that the, the air wars they fought where they were seriously outnumbered by the Arab states, the tank wars they fought, seriously outnumbered by the Arab states. And yet they rise to the occasion. The terrain doesn't stop them. And they defeated people bigger than them. And you don't even have to go to the modern day. Yeah, Jeff. Total. Yeah. And if you think about it, and I mentioned this last week, or whatever it was, I think it was last week, um, if you go back far enough, the Maccabean War was similar. I mean, the idea that the Seleucid Empire could be taken on by a little old partial part of Israel and actually driven out. Unexpected. But God restored them. Now listen, they will be as though I had not rejected them. For I am the Lord their God, and I will answer them. How many of you have ever been, I said you've made mistakes. How many of you have God really taken you to a place where you can look back on the mistake and it doesn't hurt anymore. Learn something from it that has faded. I never want batteries. Yeah. For our vehicles. We're going to have a sound brood switchover in this. It's going to be able to brood. <laughs> the bike's going to be.
There we go. We're running again. All right. The Ephraimites will become like mighty men. Their hearts will be glad as with wine. Their children will see it and be joyful. Their hearts will rejoice in the Lord. Now, if you remember back in time, the Ephraimites were the strongest tribe in the north. Ephraim and Manasseh were the strongest from Joseph, right? They were bigger between the two of them than almost all the other tribes in the north combined. What's the big tribe in the south? Judah, way bigger than Benjamin, okay? But those three, they all got beat up. But God says, I am going to restore it. Their children will see it and be joyful. Their hearts will rejoice in the Lord. That's a good thing. When God puts this back together and makes it happen. So great beginning. God's going to give that victory. Verse 8. I will signal for them and gather them in. Surely I will redeem them. They will be as numerous as before. Though I scatter them among the peoples, yet in distant lands they will remember me. They and their children will survive and they will return. I will bring them back from Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them to Gilead and Lebanon and there will not be room enough for them. They will pass through the sea of trouble. The surging sea will be subdued and all the depths of the Nile will dry up. Assyria's pride will be brought down, and Egypt's scepter will pass away. I will strengthen them in the Lord, and in his name they will walk. Okay, I read that all instead of going a verse at a time. This happened in Israel history more than once. They were hauled away to Babylon. They were dispersed into Assyria. And how many of you know that some came home? Ezra, Nehemiah, you know, Esther's about Jews that are still outside the kingdom, but same time period. Jews are starting to come back to their homeland again. Cool. And then later in history, we find you had another diaspora under Rome. The Jews were kicked out. Literally, after the Bar Kokhba rebellion, about 120 AD, the Jews were told, they, they literally plowed Jerusalem, sowed it with salt so nothing would grow, built a new city, and Rome named it Aelia Capitolina. They made it, gave it a Latin name, and they refused to allow Jews in at all. They couldn't even go in for about 30 years. Rome was trying to say, last time, last rebellion, you're all done. And yet, it's not called Aelia Capitolina anymore. It's called Jerusalem again, even though it was ruled by Persians and then Ottomans and then, right, Greeks, all these other people that ruled it, at the end, God did exactly what he said here in verse 8 and brought them home. They and their children will survive and they will return. How many of you have family that live in far distant places in this country? Okay, Ben. Well, you, you know, other countries. Where, where's your farthest family member that you're thinking of right now? Peru. Peru is not around here. Go home and check your maps. Peru is not around here. Okay. Um, if you went to live in Peru, how long do you think it would take before you kind of figured out the language and the culture? Because you've lived here long enough to be fully aware of this, right? But once upon a time, your dad was there, Right? He was born here in the United States, but he did a lot of his growing up in Peru and Ecuador and Germany and those places, right? But you're here. So you have loved ones you could go back to see, but it doesn't seem like home anymore. Because you've become what? An American. No, that's cool. How many, how many now, I, I always say, you know, I always say, if God called me south, I'd have to ask for an ID card. I'm kidding. I'm not, not really. You want to go where God sends you to go. I'm not picking on down south, but I am a northern boy. I really don't have any great, what's that? They have big bugs down there. There's some cool culture down there. There's some awesome food down south. But the idea of spending all summer trying not to have my hair catch on fire from, you know, I, no, don't want to do that. I like it up here. I can handle snow. My tagline is you can always put on so many clothes. You always put on more clothes. Once you get naked and you're still melting, it's not good. Okay? I am not a southern boy. It's just not going to happen. 
But you know that there's a large number of blags down in Arkansas? We have no idea if we're related to them or not. I think we're the weird outcasts. There's like almost none of us up here, and it's a weird enough name. I don't think anybody just woke up one day and said, Blag, I'm going to go with that. I, I don't think so. I mean, so how did we get here, and why are we doing this? And I don't know. But we've come here, and we've settled in here. My point is, imagine being a Jew and being born in Assyria or Babylon or Egypt or something else and spending your life there and having your kids there and watching your grandkids there. What are the odds that you would turn into an Egyptian, an Assyrian, a Babylonian? Just like somehow I got to be a northerner and Ben doesn't live in Peru anymore. Right? It would be easy. But you realize all over the world, even to today, there are Jews that say, it's time to leave Russia, it's time to leave Eastern Europe, it's time to leave the United States, it's time to leave, leave, leave these places and go back to a home I've never been to. A home my great-great-grandparents never were there. Okay. That's cool. Now I have a tub here. You know, I have mm -hmm. colleagues here that I follow on Facebook and we can translate and stuff. But I never had that before. But once I got that ancestral thing, and I think like the Jews too, once they realize, well, they have it all written down, their ancestors. You know? Yeah. So they don't have that tub here. And that's pretty cool. Have you ever gone to Legs Inn? Okay, see, that's, if, you're, if you're Polish or think you're Polish, and you have to go to Legs Inn. That's like a test. If you haven't done that, you may not be Polish, okay? <laughs> if you're looking at me going, huh? You're either not Polish or you're keeping the secret. I, I don't know. All right. Um, what we have here in verse 10 and 11 is in, in poetry is called the chiasm. If you notice, it starts with saying, Egypt, I will bring them back from Egypt, gather them from Assyria. And then down at the end of verse 11, Assyria's pride will be brought down, Egypt's scepter will pass away. So you have a series of almost parenthetical statements. And they're reversed in order on purpose. It's just a bit of ancient poetry. I like the middle where the emotional center is. They will pass through the sea of trouble. The surging sea will be subdued and the depths of the Nile will dry up. I don't like chaos. Anybody here, you love chaos? How many of you are lovers of chaos? Bring it! I don't want, I don't want to know what the rule is. How many of you like some degree of predictability? You kind of like to think you get a next paycheck. You probably get to keep your house. You probably have reasonably good medical care and stay somewhat healthy, right? I mean, why do we have prayer requests for health issues? Because some chaos has come into our life. All of a sudden there's a surgery that's necessary or a biopsy that has to be done or, or somebody you know, had a brain bleed. And that's not normal. And we're like, okay, God, we know these things happen, but we would rather have these people well and, and their life going on in a predictable and reasonable fashion, right? That, that would make us feel better. So we ask him to take care of it. Do you realize that what God is telling Israel is that someday all the chaos, all the pushing around that you've had will change. Does that happen in life in general? I'm going to go back to that adult teenage thing. How many of you adults remember some of what you were like as a teenager? You were awesome. I love Priya. It was awesome. Good deal. Um, are you? Are you still some? Do you have some parts of your life, parts of your attitude, parts of your thinking that still are very much like you were once upon a time? <laughs> the immaturity part. Of yeah, we probably do, right? I mean, you're the same human being. But how many of you are exactly the same as you were when you were a kid? How many of you were shy and awkward as a kid? How many of you still feel shy and awkward as an adult? 
interesting because I'm looking at the people who are raising their hand, and I would say I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have picked you for that. I was. I was shy and awkward. Now you can't keep my mouth shut. That may not be a good thing. I don't know. But, I mean, you change, right? You decide to do different things. You change. God was going to take the chaos of Israel's average teenage years and was going to begin to make a change in it to break the surging sea, the issue of chaos, the depths of the Nile, the obstacles that you face. What are your obstacles? Now, this verse is not a promise to you. This verse is a prophetic statement about Israel's future. Unless you and I are Jewish, and we know it, and I don't think any of us are, then that is not aimed directly at us. But how many of you know that God in other places, Jesus in other places, tells us that the obstacles and the problems in our life can be broken? And those promises are for us. So the same character of God that's revealed to his people Israel is also revealed to the rest of us crazy Gentiles who are in Christ. And yet, I'll bet there were times when the Jewish people looked at that verse and said, yeah, not today. We're still under the control of the Greeks. We're still under the control of the Romans or the Ottomans or the Russians or the British or somebody. God hasn't taken the chaos away. Do you ever feel like God hasn't taken the chaos away? Do you know that he still can? And we have to trust that he still will. And it's easier to say than it is to do, admittedly, but I, I think we need to trust that he will. I will strengthen them in the Lord, and in his name they will walk. So it, it's not that in our name, in our authority, in our plan, but in his name he will make us walk by his strength. Chapter 11. Open your doors, O Lebanon. Now, all of a sudden, we, we get a switch. In these prophetic books, there are tone switches. You just had chapter 10, and there's all these amazing things. He's saying, you know, as you follow me, my people, these things are going to happen. Yay, team! And we have a big gear shift here in chapter 11, verse 1. And you go, huh? Open your doors, O Lebanon, so that fire may devour your cedars. Um... How many of you know that Lebanon was always famous for cedar trees and still is? In fact, if you look at somebody, somebody Google on your phone, because y'all got them. So Google on your phone the Lebanese flag. It's got a tree on it. Anybody have any idea what kind of tree is on there? A cedar tree. So, I mean, you know, this is just, this is a stamp. See, you didn't even have to Google. You're so much smarter than Google. That's cool. I mean, right? I mean, this is, they have been known for this. So, the point of this setup is that something that is primary for them, part of their identity, part of what they're known for, is going to be destroyed. Wail, O pine tree, for the cedar has fallen. The stately trees are ruined. Okay, well, what, what is this about pine trees? Now, pine trees have a use. Historically, pine trees are one of the things that navies wanted because they made good masts if they were tall enough. But how many of you know that cedar wood is definitely more expensive than pine? Anybody here go and buy lumber lately? I mean, it's not as bad as it was, but it's still isn't good. How many of you know that it's cheaper to buy a 2 by 4 which is often made out of pine or some other white, what they call white wood, you know, God knows what tree it came out of, that those are still cheaper than cedar or oak or mahogany. Or, I mean, there are some really fancy woods out there that have some neat attributes to them. Well, what we need to look at in this particular first verse and second verse is if the cedar is going to burn, if the fancy, the, the, the best, the, the one everybody wants is going to go, you figure that the lower trees are going to go too. That any disaster that's going to sweep up the best and the greatest is probably going to take out the less important. Now maybe the greatest way to say that if you're wondering, have you ever seen a mountainside that has been clear cut? So a lumber company goes in, 
And they, I mean, this is far less, I don't think it's even legal to do a lot of this anymore, or only in smaller areas. But back in the day, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, they could go in and literally clear cut an entire mountain. And so you had these beautiful forests, and now they're gone. And pretty soon you have erosion and destruction, and now they're forced to, they have to reforest them and do other things. But when they go in to cut down the trees back in those days, they didn't go in and say, oh, I'm going to leave that one. It was just easier to blast everything down and sort it out at the end. So if the fancy trees are going to go, the simple trees are going to go. Then it goes, the whale oaks of Bashan. Now that would have been some of the best trees in standard Israeli territory. That would have been the Transjordan area. The dense forest has been cut down. What you're used to, the best things you were depending on, have been removed. Verse 3. Listen to the wail of the shepherds. Their rich pastures are destroyed. Ooh. Now again, any, do we have any, uh, any budding shepherds here? Any people go out and shep? Do you shep occasionally? Okay, you're a ranch hand. So you, you dealt with sheep on a ranch. Okay, cool. Alpacas. Ah, sheep, alpacas. Okay, Four-legged critters with fur. Okay, I, I get it. Um, there are easier places to put those animals where they get good grass and they grow. And you know, there is a reason. How many of you like animals? You think animals are sweet and wonderful, and you have them as pets and you have them for fun. How many of you know that a smart farmer can't get attached to it, their animals? If you do, life just hurts all the time, right? You know, I mean. I, I told you this before, I remember raising a baby calf, and we knew, because we, my great uncle had a farm, we knew this was veal. We named it veal, <laughs> because it wasn't going to grow up and be a big, strong cow. It was going to be eaten with Italian food, because that's what you do. And you, you just get used to that, right? I mean, it, it is what it is. If you're saying, Pastor, you're so mean, that's the difference between a working farm and a pet lover. They're just not the same things. But in this particular verse, how many of you know that when the pastures are destroyed, your working farm doesn't work very good? So there, there's going to be another resource taken away. Listen to the roar of the lions. The lush thicket of the Jordan is ruined. So all of the places that were profitable, beneficial, are going to be swept away for some reason at some time. And so now we need to find out in verse 4 why. This is what the Lord my God says. Now this is interesting. In this case, remember I've talked about type and anti-type before. I've used those terms anyway, whether you remember what they are or not. Does anybody remember what they are? What is a type? What is an anti-type? What does that mean? What's that? Well, yeah, they're opposites. Yeah, that, that's true. It, it, they do different things. Um, a type is an example. Okay? Um, when I say the capital, what does that mean? Capital America. Washington, D.C. Okay, cool. Okay, big city. Uh, uh, how many of you saw it? Lansing. L Lansing is a capital. Because it is one. How many of you know that little old Howell is a capital? It's the capital of Livingston County. I don't think that very many people think of Howell when the words the capital are used, right? Now you could say that Howell is a type. It is an example, very small scale, pretty unimportant in the grand scheme of the world. We like it, or Fowlerville, or Pinckney, or Brain, or wherever you're from, right? We like it, but it's home to us. But we don't think of that as the capital. And most of us don't even think of Lansing as the capital. I mean, you, know, you kind of look up to the United States and Washington, D.C., right? Okay, so it's a type. It's an example. In this case, the reason I bring it up is when it says, This is what the Lord my God says, shepherd the flock, mark, mark for slaughter. This is a command given to Zechariah personally to function as a spiritual leader and prophet, but not just because God says, Well, I like you and you're smarter than everybody else. He's asking Zechariah to do a job as a type, an example of the Messiah who is to come. 
the Messiah is Jesus. Now, we're not saying Zechariah is Jesus or Zechariah is equal to Jesus. Not at all. We're just saying that the function that Zechariah is going to do, he's going to do at God's command to set an example for what the Messiah will come to do. Yeah, Kathy. Yeah, Kathy. That is a really good guess. I like your guess. It's not, it's not where this is, but that is a good guess in general. So I love the fact that you guys think those things through. That's awesome. I never want to, I never want to sound like I'm correcting, like, oh, you did that bad. Never, because if you don't think it through, you'll never know how to think it through. So brilliant, Kathy. Thank you. Look at it in context. This is what the Lord my God says. Pasture the flock marked for slaughter. Their buyers slaughter them and go unpunished. Those who sell them say, praise the Lord, I am rich. Their own shepherds do not spare them. Okay, so Zechariah is being told to give some spiritual leadership to the people of Israel. Why? What's that? Okay, well, God's judgment is part of it. See, I'm like, yeah, that, that's, he, he's going to do, do a grander scheme. There, who are their who are their shepherds? Slower, lowercase s. The priests. We don't have a king right now. They're under the control of Persia, so they, we're not talking about a Davidic king that's messing up. Their religious leaders, their spiritual leaders, are the Levitical priesthood, and they are selling them down the river. Rather than leading them in God's path, the people that God had commissioned specifically to do a job are selling the people they're supposed to protect down the river. And they're saying, look, I'm rich. I've got all this stuff. How many of you know that, unfortunately, some pastors, like some presidents and politicians, and you name them, can sell people down the river for their own gain? I'm not here to give you a list of bad guys and good guys, bad girls and good girls. Not my job. I'm not the judge. I'm just saying that can happen. And we got to be really careful of that, right? That's not the message that we want to send ever. Their own shepherds don't spare them. For I will no longer have pity on the people of the land, declares the Lord. I will hand everyone over to his neighbor and his king. They will oppress the land, and I will not rescue them from their hands. Now this is interesting. God has told him to shepherd them, but he's also told them, told them it's a lost cause. Type and anti-type. Would Jesus come quite a bit later and begin to teach them the truth, live out the truth, do miracles that pointed to the truth on the streets and hillsides of Middle East? Yeah. Would most people turn to him? Not at that point. Yes, there have been people coming for 2,000 years since, and we're some of them. Praise God. But at that point, you remember, by the time his shepherding was done, the crowd would be screaming, crucify him. Crucify him. So, there, you could say, it wouldn't be honest, how many of you are glad that God didn't figure you were a lost cause? How many of you are glad that, that he died on the cross so we don't have to be a lost cause? Okay, that, that, that's, that's hugely important. But in this type, anti-type, we see that this shepherd, this type of the Messiah, is going to face a basically almost lost cause. Verse 7, so I pastured the flock, marked for slaughter particularly the oppressed of the flock. Now that is a very pastoral or priestly role, right? Find the weak, find the broken, find the needy, try to help them in some way, right? Okay, encourage them, teach them. Okay. Uh, then I took two staffs, and we're not talking about like, you know, people that work for you, but in this case, sticks, big sticks. Then I took two staffs and called one favor and the other union, and I pastured the flock. Now those are interesting. Favor of whom? Favor from whom? 
God. God commissioned them to be the leader, the spiritual guide. So he gives a symbolic meaning to a stick. He says, this is favor. You are existing. How many of you know that God's favor, like a stick, can guide you and direct you at times? Anybody here, we did this one time a long time ago when, when we had a boys program called Royal Rangers. And we went up to um, Lost Valley. And it was a dark night. They picked a really dark night on purpose. And it was all of us who were there for leaders. We weren't boys at that point. I was an adult, you know. And we're in this thing. And they start us out in this almost starless night. It was so dark and overcast. And they took us from the main camp section down around. If you've ever been to the camp, it's down around that lake that you see when you drive in, that little mini lake. And there's a woods area behind that that's the real lost valley of the, of the campground. And you're in the trees. And you can't see a doggone thing. But somebody's hand is on your shoulder. And in the back of the line and in the front of the line are two people who know where they're going. And you, that was your steering point. And you don't want to run into a tree with your face. Does that sound fun, Elise? Would you like to run into a tree? No, it would be lousy. So, I mean, you know, we're literally walking in there. And they, they walked us, and we had no idea. And finally, we kind of figured, okay, I can see a little bit of the sky above me. Not much. It's pretty dark. But I can see a little bit of sky above me. And we were out in the middle of a field. And suddenly there's a kind of cool chemistry trick that you can do with glycerin and potassium permanganate where it, it becomes exothermic. And so if you take a jar of, of, uh, of uh, glycerin and you pour it on a fire, the wood is not burning, but it's been laced with potassium permanganate. Permanganate, I can talk. It bursts into flames. And it was the coolest thing. We're all standing in this field and whoosh, this giant fire goes up. And we have this church service out there. It's like, wow, it was cool. But just the point that you had to be guided in so Zechariah is saying, I've got this thing called favor. God's favor is being used to direct this flock that unfortunately are thick skulls and are marked for slaughter. But his favor is tapping them so that they respond to it. How many of you would like to have God's favor? I'll get you in a second, John. How many of you would like to have God's favor in your life? So when bad things happen, you kind of think, eh, maybe you shouldn't go that way. And when good things happen, you hope, well, maybe I'm going the right way. You know, and, and that can be overdone, but in this case, it is a guide. John. Uh, in my new King James Version, it says, I took for myself two staffs, the one that I call beauty, mm -hmm. and the other I call God. Okay. Uh-huh. That's another way to translate those. And, and you can do it. In this case, I think that it's kind of a simpler look with favor. But, you know, beauty is also a beautiful thing. Be favor is a beautiful thing, isn't it? When things are going your way and things work well. So that's the other side of the translation. If you looked in five different translations, you'd probably get three or four different words for that. But they're going to follow the same things. This is actually an NIV translation here. Not better or worse. It's just what I actually am keyed to at the moment. Um, the other union... What's the value of union or unity? What's the value of that? Yeah, Kathy. Going in the same direction. Going in the same direction. It's a good thing. You're not fighting each other. You're not competing for the same set of resources, guidance, intelligence. Michelle. Yep. Okay. The, you know, it, it's amazing. Back to that navel thing. How many of you have ever had a little rope? You know, rope's only so big. What's the biggest rope you've ever actually seen? On a ship. How big was that rope? That big? Okay. There were ropes on Royal Navy ships back in the 1700s and 1800s that they sometimes had to use to tow each other if somebody got shot up or drowned. Or, and they could be anywhere 25 inches around. Enormous. They weighed tons, you know, and it would take the whole crew to move them and deploy them. Just enormously heavy ropes. You can pull a lot with that. So union is good. Whether you have blessing and bonds, you can see how bonds and union fit. You're tied together. You're in union. And beauty and favor can go that way too. It's good things that are coming around you. It says, and I pastured the flock. Reaching out to Israel, he's trying, trying to give guidance in a type fashion, showing them God's favor, 
and unity that they should flow together in. Now, verse 8, we have a hard time understanding. Lots of theories. In one month, I got rid of three shepherds. Lots of different theories as to who he's talking about based on the time that he's talking about it. But how many of you know what he's saying is there were people that had been doing the job, these people who were selling their own people down the river, saying, I'm rich. He got rid of some of them. There were people that got, if you will, fired from the priesthood because he was serving in a spiritual leadership sense and the people at least listened to him enough that they cut out some priests that were doing things incorrectly. Now the next sentence is interesting. The flock detested me. What, what, what do you have in yours? Again, different translations. Yeah, in this case, it's actually that the flock hated him for the steering he was giving them. You ever see people that you ever see people that don't like the direction that leadership is going? Yeah. Now, I mean, it, it's kind of easy, right? I mean, probably I'm going to give a reasonable guess. You know, do I have friends? who do not agree with my politics. Yes, yes I do. And do I manage to treat them well and they manage to treat me fairly well? Yes. You know, I have relatives, not many, but I have some relatives who are really kind of over there on the left. Do I go to their house and whip out the, hey, did you see what, no. I go and we have whatever dinner or whatever, you know, too. we just don't talk about those things. So can you hang around people that disagree with you? Sure. It's easy for us in here to say, and even as you were maybe referring to, Mitchell, that there's a lot of people in the United States right now that don't like what leadership is doing, right? There's somebody who is, quote, the shepherd, politically speaking, not religiously speaking, and we can go, that's stupid. We're not going to do that. We don't like that. Okay, but have you ever seen people dislike somebody who's trying to do something good for you? Parents and, okay, back to that parents and kids thing. Young people, how many of you have ever been told to do something by your parents that you were not fond of doing? They're all like, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm just keeping that quiet. Plead the Fifth Amendment. Okay, so I'll go up a generation. How many of those of us who are a little older remember occasionally being told by our parents to do things we didn't want to do? Yeah. Now I think of another good illustration. I remember when, when Luke was coaching uh, baseball. I bet you there were times that those students did not want to do what he said. Even though he's persuasive. Even though he knows what he's doing, right? How many bases do I want to run? How many balls do I want to catch? Not that many. It's 90 degrees. I want to go home. I want to watch TV. I don't want to do this. But do you get any better playing baseball unless you practice the fundamentals? No, right? How many of you remember you loved homework? You adored homework. You wanted to do more of it. You asked, you begged the teachers to give you homework. Yeah, right, you know. It didn't happen, right? You might have been good at it, but you didn't love it. Now, how many of you realize, though, that the idea was supposedly to make you smarter and help you understand the test process and other things going on? So, to a degree, although I think teachers can overdo it, to a degree, homework is actually good for you. But you didn't always want to do it. So any of us that have ever been, I'll, I'll say, I joke about this frequently. I have a doctor who's a couple years older than me, but he's skinny. Skinny Cuban guy. Like him, great doctor. But he always tells me I'm too fat. And I know some of you go, what? Yeah, he does. He always says, you need to lose 30 pounds. And I just go, yeah, whatever. And because I'm older than 50, he's telling me now every time I have to go to physical every year. And he tells me, you know, you have to go ahead and have that test thing where they run this camera up. And I go, no, not happening. But every year he tells me I need to do that. 
Right? And, nope, not happening. You know, he's like, well, I'm trying to protect you. Yeah, I know, but I've seen too much medicine in the last two or three years. I'm not doing it. You know, hey, do I like that? No. How many of you do not want to go have tests where they jam things up you? You do not want to go, no, this is not what you want to do. And yet somebody supposedly, I don't think he is, I think he's trying to check me for the things that can often break in our bodies at a certain age. So I guess I understand that even when we do well, people don't like us sometimes because we're irritating them. And the flock detested me. The flock was unhappy. He was giving them sound spiritual leadership, actually leading them in God's way, which is better than the lies that they were being sold by some in the Levitical priesthood. And still, they were not happy about it because it didn't allow the things that they wanted to do. And he says, I grew weary of them. Now, type and anti-type. This doesn't mean Jesus grew weary of us. You can't take the type anti-type thing that far. You can't say every single thing the type does automatically is done by the anti-type. But how many of you can understand Zechariah's point of view? You know who I would not have wanted to be in Scripture? Moses. On one hand, it'd be awesome. You'd see God. How cool would that be? You know, the Holy Spirit would be showing up. Your face would be glowing. You'd be, that'd be awesome. And yet, can you imagine dealing with two million whiny Jews across the desert for 40 years? I mean, the fact that he only had the one strike the rock thing. I'd be tempted to walk around with my staff and try to see if I could divide a few Jews. Whack! Worked at the Red Sea. He grew weary of them. I suppose I can forgive him for that. Verse 9, and said, I will not be your shepherd. Let the dying die and the perishing perish. Let those who are left eat one another's flesh. That sounds gross. It's like reading that book by Pierre Paul Reed called The Live. How many of you have ever seen that book about the hockey team in South America? They get stuck up in the Andes and there's no food and they're not found for a long time and eventually they start eating the dead. You know how horrifying that would be? <sighs> but he makes a point here. Is the world going to figure out a good way on their own without God. Haven't they been trying to do it for a long time? What? Yeah, yeah, they are. Society steeped in sin and rebellion becomes self-destructive. And half the time they don't even know it. And as I said, I find, I, I post very little other than my devotionals or things for the Suriname team, or you know, whatever events for the church. I post very little of my own stuff, other than the few trips I've taken um, on Facebook. I figured, you don't want to know where I ate dinner, and you don't need to know, you know, you know what I thought today when I looked at my deck and noticed it needs to be restained. You don't care, and that's fine. You shouldn't, okay? But I, I do know that sometimes we expose things on social media that kind of tell who we are and how we think. And, and there was somebody that was I went to high school with. She was a year older than me. And for some reason, you know, we never liked each other, but my mom was always terrified that we did. I have no idea why. We, we were never an issue. But she posted something the other day online. She had seen a sign. She's vaguely Catholic. She had seen the sign that you've seen, no Jesus, no peace. No, K-N-O Jesus, no peace. And her response was, I don't even understand that. I know a lot of atheists that are perfectly happy and there's all these religious wars that have killed all these people. I I'm getting to that in a minute. The thinking was wrong. And I wanted to respond, but I didn't want to get in a flame war with her because it wasn't my point. But how many of you realize that even in human history, without being spiritual, that her thinking was wrong? Because the greatest devastations of world peace that have ever happened, the greatest losses of human life ever happening in history, happened at the hands of atheistic politicians. Add them up. 
All the religious wars you want to tack together that have happened, as horrible as those could be. I'm not saying those were good. And how many of you know most religious wars really aren't about religion anyway? They're about politics. And religion is just used as the excuse to motivate people. It's about politics. But when it's atheists, they are really doing it because their philosophy is you're worthless and you have to do it my way. It is religious. It's a religion focused on themselves as a leader or a system. So the greatest number of human deaths in human history have happened because of atheists. And they don't even understand it. They'll eat each other's flesh. The systems don't work. They're broken. But humans keep doing it. We can't figure out what gender we are. We can't figure out where we should go. We can't figure out... We live in an increasingly confused society. Now, you can say, oh, I agree with you, or oh, I don't agree with you, but how many of you realize we are not more at peace, we are not more stable, we are not happier, we are not developing a better society in any realistic way today than we were 50 or 60 years ago? It's gone downhill. Thanks, Pastor, we're really happy now, it's time for us to leave. <laughs> but the point is, let the dying die, let the perish be. If we don't have good spiritual leadership in a family, in a church, in a country, in an area, bad things mount up. That's not the arrogant statement of somebody who says, I want to be the leader, follow me. That's just reality. And Zechariah said, I tried it. I tried to do the right things. I tried to help you. I tried to point you in God's directions. And you thick skulls drove me crazy. So I'm done. And I know that given time, you will destroy each other. And historically, well, he was right. And I'm going to stop right there at verse 10. It does get better. It does. But I have to go too far to get beyond it. So I'm just going to stop Lord Jesus, thank you. I, I know, you know, we, we, can, we can laugh about something like this. It's, it's not quite as threatening because it's talking about people that lived a long time ago. And, and, and we hope that, well, this isn't really pointing to us. This is pointing to them. But Lord Jesus, the principles still work in our world. Even if they're not really aimed at us, they work in our world. And Lord Jesus, how do we live in that time here? How do we, how do we deal with this? Lord, I don't think that you called us like Zechariah, and certainly you didn't call us to be messiahs, not at all. But you did call us to be examples. You did call us to be those who follow the Messiah, Jesus Christ. You did cause us, call us to make choices that follow your word and follow your principles so that others can see something that is more healthy, more sane, more stable, definitely more godly than anything the world could ever create. So God, I know that it's easy. It's very easy. I can do this too. It is so easy for me to watch YouTube clips and get upset, or watch the nightly news and get upset. Sure. But Lord, all the upset in the world won't fix anything. God, you call us, in a sense, to be shepherds, to try to tap people and show them where God is and what God is doing. Not because we think we're any smarter than anybody else or any more moral than anybody else, but we do know who has the answer. And God, they may not always like what we say and we may get tired of doing it, just like Zechariah did. But I ask you that you'd help us. Because I think it's always worthwhile. Give somebody a chance to see the God who can take them out of a place where they're going to destroy themselves. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. God bless you this evening.